Hello, I'm Michael Conant, an attorney with the Fluoride Action Network. If you live in the United States, the odds are pretty high that fluoride chemicals are added to your tap water. Fluoride is added to water as a way to prevent tooth decay. Although health authorities in North America continue to promote fluoridation, a number of communities have recently decided to end their fluoridation programs. In Canada, the number of people drinking fluoridated water has dropped by about 25% since 2008. So why are some communities ending fluoridation? To help answer that question, let's take a look at 10 basic facts about fluoride. Fact number one, most developed countries do not fluoridate their water. In the United States, health authorities call fluoridation one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. Few other countries, however, share this view. In fact, there are now more people drinking fluoridated water in the United States alone than the rest of the world combined. This is because most advanced nations do not fluoridate their water. In Western Europe, for example, 97% of the population has water without a single drop of fluoride added to it. Fact number two, fluoridated countries do not have less tooth decay than non-fluoridated countries. It is often claimed that fluoridated water is the main reason the United States has seen a significant decline in tooth decay over the past 60 years. However, this same decline in tooth decay has occurred in all developed countries, most of which have never added any fluoride to their water. Today, according to data from the World Health Organization, there is no discernible difference in tooth decay between the minority of developed countries that fluoridate their water and the majority that do not. Fact number three, fluoride affects many tissues in the body besides the teeth. Advocates of fluoridation have long claimed that the safety of fluoridation is beyond scientific debate. However, according to the well-known toxicologist, Dr. John Duell, who chaired the National Academy of Sciences Review on Fluoride, the safety of fluoridation remains poorly studied and largely unknown. In 2006, Duell's committee at the NAS published a comprehensive 500-page review of fluoride's toxicity. The report concludes that fluoride is an endocrine disruptor and can affect many things in the body, including the bones, the brain, the thyroid gland, the pineal gland, and even blood sugar levels. So far from giving fluoride a clean bill of health, the NAS called on scientists to investigate if current fluoride exposures in the United States are contributing to chronic health problems, like bone disorders, thyroid disease, low intelligence, dementia, and diabetes particularly in people who are most vulnerable to fluoride's effects. These recommendations highlight that despite 60 years of fluoridation, many of the basic studies necessary for determining the program's safety have yet to be conducted. Fact number four, fluoridation is not a natural process. Fluoridation advocates often claim that nature thought of fluoridation first. By this, advocates mean that fluoride can occur at naturally high levels in some water supplies. However, lots of toxic substances like arsenic and even some medicines like lithium can occur at naturally high levels. This doesn't mean that they're safe. Plus, the level of fluoride that is found in the vast majority of fresh surface water like rivers and lakes, is far lower than the level of fluoride added in fluoridation programs. In the rare circumstance where a river or a pond has the same level of fluoride that is added to tap water, studies have found that salmon and frogs suffer serious harm, including bone disease, changes in behavior, and shorter lifespan. Also, the main fluoride chemical that is added to water is not what most people would call a naturally occurring compound. It is a corrosive acid captured in the 
air pollution control devices of the phosphate fertilizer industry. So why is fluoride captured in air pollution control devices? Because fluoride gases are hazardous air pollutants that, if released into the air, cause significant environmental harm. Now, just because fluoridation chemicals are derived from the toxic gases of the fertilizer industry doesn't necessarily mean that they're unsafe when diluted down into our tap water. Recent studies, however, suggest that these chemicals may present unique risks that are not found with natural fluorides. Fact number five. 40% of American teenagers show visible signs of fluoride overexposure. According to a recent national survey by the Centers for Disease Control, about 40% of American teenagers now have a condition called dental fluorosis. Fluorosis is a defect of tooth enamel that is caused by fluoride's interference with tooth forming cells. The condition shows as white spots and streaks, and in more severe cases, brown stains, and tooth erosion. In the 1950s, health officials claimed that fluorosis would only affect about 10% of children in fluoridated areas and would be limited to its most mild forms. This, however, has proven false. Not only do 40% of American teenagers now have fluorosis, but in some fluoridated areas, the rate is as high as 70 to 80% with some children suffering advanced forms of the condition. The high rate of fluorosis that we now see reflects the fact that children today are receiving fluoride from many sources besides tap water. When fluoridation first began, there was not a single tube of toothpaste that contained fluoride. Today, if you go to a grocery store, it can be difficult to find any toothpaste that doesn't contain fluoride. In addition to toothpaste, many processed beverages and foods made in fluoridated countries also contain elevated levels of fluoride. This is because when you add fluoride to water, you don't just add fluoride to the water itself, you add fluoride to all of the foods and beverages that are made with that water. And there are other sources of fluoride as well, including fluoride pesticides, tea, Teflon pans, and some fluorinated pharmaceuticals. The concern today, therefore, is not just about the safety of fluoridated water by itself, but the safety of fluoridated water in combination with all of the other sources to which we're now exposed. Fact number six. For infants, fluoridated water provides no benefits, only risks. Up until the 1990s, health authorities advised parents to give fluoride to newborn babies. This is no longer the case. Today, the Institute of Medicine recommends that babies consume a minuscule 10 micrograms of fluoride per day. 10 micrograms of fluoride is roughly the equivalent of what babies ingest from breast milk. Breast milk contains virtually no fluoride. By contrast, Infants who consume fluoridated water in baby formula consume up to 700 to 1,200 micrograms per day, which is about 100 times more fluoride than the Institute of Medicine now recommends. According to the CDC, these early spikes of fluoride exposure provide no known advantage to teeth. These spikes can, however, produce harm. For example, recent studies have found that babies who drink fluoridated water in their formula develop significantly higher rates of dental fluorosis in their permanent front teeth. Because of this, a number of prominent dental researchers now advise that parents should not add fluoridated water to baby formula. And teeth are not the only concern. In July of 2012, a team of Harvard scientists warned that the developing brain may be another target for fluoride toxicity. The Harvard team based this warning on a large number of studies from China that have found reduced IQ scores among children exposed to elevated levels of fluoride during the early years of life. Twelve of the studies that the Harvard team reviewed 
found IQ loss at levels of fluoride exposure currently deemed safe in the United States. And one of the studies, which was sponsored by UNICEF, found IQ loss among nutritionally deprived children at the same level of fluoride that is added to water in fluoridation programs. Fact number seven, fluoride supplements have never been approved by the FDA. This pill that I'm holding here is called a fluoride supplement. It's designed to provide young children who live in non-fluoridated areas the same dose of fluoride that they would receive by drinking fluoridated water. This particular pill, which is to be chewed and swallowed once a day, contains 0.25 milligrams of fluoride. That's the same dose of fluoride that is found in about one glass of fluoridated water. But you can't just go into a grocery store and buy this pill. Instead, due to fluoride's toxicity, you need to have a doctor's prescription. Yet, although fluoride supplements have been prescribed for over 50 years, and although federal law requires that all prescription drugs be approved as safe and effective by the FDA, the FDA has never approved fluoride supplements for the prevention of tooth decay. In fact, the only fluoride supplements that the FDA has ever reviewed have been rejected. So with fluoridation, we are adding to the water a prescription strength dose of a drug that has never been approved by the FDA. Fact number eight, fluoride is the only medicine that is intentionally added to water. Fluoride is the only chemical that we add to water that doesn't actually treat the water. Chlorine, for example, is added to water to kill the bacteria so that when we drink the water, we don't get sick. Fluoride, by contrast, is added to provide a medical treatment for a disease that is not caused by the water. Now, fluoridation proponents claim that fluoridation is not a medication because in their view, it's no different than adding iodine to salt or vitamin D to milk. However, proponents fail to acknowledge that iodine and vitamin D are both essential nutrients, but fluoride is not. An essential nutrient is something the body has a physiological demand for. We need them. If we don't have enough iodine, for example, the thyroid gland will not function properly. Now, fluoridation advocates sometimes claim that fluoride is also a nutrient, but the National Academy of Sciences has repeatedly confirmed that this is not the case. Because fluoride is not a nutrient, the FDA has defined fluoride as a drug when used to prevent disease. Tooth decay is a disease. So when fluoride is added to a pill to prevent tooth decay, the FDA labels it a drug. And when fluoride is added to toothpaste to prevent tooth decay, the FDA again labels it a drug. So as a matter of logic, adding fluoride to water to prevent tooth decay is a form of medication. In fact, this is a key reason why many European nations rejected fluoridation, because in their view, the water supply is not an appropriate way to deliver a medicine. Because with all other medicines, it is the patient, not the doctor, that has the right to decide which medications to take. Fluoridation denies people this basic right. Fact number nine. Ingesting fluoride provides little benefit to teeth. When water fluoridation first began back in the 1940s, the medical profession believed that fluoride needed to be ingested to be most effective at preventing cavities. This was why fluoride was added to water and pills, because these are things that people swallow. Today, however, it is widely recognized that fluoride's main benefit does not actually come from ingestion. It comes from fluoride's topical contact with the teeth, a fact that even the Centers for Disease Control has now acknowledged. So with fluoridation, we are not only adding a medicine to water, we are adding a medicine that does not actually need to be swallowed. Fact number 10, disadvantaged communities are the most disadvantaged by fluoride. 
For many people, the main selling point for water fluoridation is the idea that it can provide dental care to those who can't afford a dentist. In the United States, there is a serious shortage of dentists who will treat low-income patients. Up to 80% of dentists, for example, will not accept children on Medicaid. The notion, however, that we can compensate for this lack of care by forcing poor populations to consume fluoride chemicals is a dangerous one. Here's why. The dose of fluoride that can be safe for a healthy person can be harmful for a person in poor health. Children with nutrient deficiencies, for example, have been found to suffer significantly higher rates of dental fluorosis and greater damage to their brain from fluoride exposure than children with optimal nutrition. And in the 1970s, studies convincingly proved that dialysis patients were suffering incapacitating bone disease from the inclusion of fluoridated water in dialysis treatment. Although dialysis centers now filter the fluoride out, recent studies show that dialysis patients continue to accumulate high levels of fluoride in their bone, high enough to put them at risk for bone damage. So how does this relate to the question of whether fluoridation is good for low-income populations? It relates because kidney disease, poor nutrition, and other health problems are far more prevalent in poor populations than affluent ones. This may help explain why African-American and Mexican-American children suffer significantly higher rates of dental fluorosis. These disparities in fluoride risks have prompted several civil rights leaders, including the former mayor of Atlanta and the nation's largest Hispanic civil rights organization, to call for an end to fluoridation. And finally, claims that fluoridation can prevent the high rates of tooth decay now seen in poor areas do not withstand scrutiny. This picture shows an example of baby bottle tooth decay. This is the most devastating form of tooth decay seen in poor communities. Studies in the United States have repeatedly found that fluoridated water does not prevent this condition. But the big elephant in the room is this. The vast majority of poor urban areas have been fluoridated for over 30 years and yet are still suffering from what many are calling a oral health crisis. In Cincinnati, the city's dental director described the state of oral health among poor children as absolutely heartbreaking and a travesty, noting that people would be shocked to learn how bad the problem has become. Cincinnati has been fluoridated since 1979. In Chicago, 64% of third graders have tooth decay. Chicago has been fluoridated since 1956. In Boston, black teeth rotted down to the roots have been described as a common occurrence in the city's poor neighborhoods, despite being, as one nurse put it, a sight we should never see in this country. Boston has been fluoridated since 1978. Poor populations need dental care, not cheap industrial chemicals in their water. The millions of dollars spent each year promoting fluoridation would be better spent advocating for policies that will provide real dental care, like allowing dental therapists to provide affordable care to populations who have no practical access to dentists.